In this video, we're going to discuss the osteology of the vertebral column and the structures of the superficial back. Section 1, Vertebral Osteology. The word osteology means the study of bones. The skeletal system is the structural framework on which and around which the rest of the body is built. In general, the skeletal system can be divided into an axial skeleton, shown here on the left, and an appendicular skeleton, shown here on the right. The axial skeleton is comprised of the skull, the vertebral column, the ribs, and the sternum, as well as a small bone in the neck called the hyoid bone. The appendicular skeleton, as its name implies, is made up of the appendages and their component parts. So the upper limb and the lower limbs, including the shoulder and pelvic girdles, make up the appendicular skeleton. In the case of the upper limb, notice how the clavicle acts as a strut connecting the upper limb to the axial skeleton. The vertebral column runs the entire length of the back and is divided into five regions. The seven cervical vertebrae, shown here in green, are located in the neck, and they are responsible for supporting and moving the head. The cervical vertebrae transmit the spinal cord along with the vertebral vessels, which are responsible for supplying blood to the brain. In the thoracic region, there are 12 thoracic vertebrae, which articulate with the 12 pairs of ribs. Along with the ribs, these vertebrae will help to protect the vital organs of the thorax. There are five lumbar vertebrae, shown here in pink. These vertebrae are very large in order to bear the weight of the upper body. The sacrum and coccyx are unique because they are both made up of vertebrae that have fused together. The sacrum is made up of five fused vertebrae, which articulate with the pelvic bones, and the sacrum functions to transmit the weight of the upper body to the lower limb through the pelvic girdle. And then at the very end of the vertebral column is the coccyx, which is composed of either three or four fused coxal bones. The colloquial term for coccyx is the tailbone, so when someone breaks their tailbone, they have broken their coccyx. When viewed in the sagittal plane, the adult vertebral column has a number of curvatures, which enables us to maintain our center of balance in an upright bipedal stance. The primary curves in the thoracic and sacral regions persist from development into adult life. The primary curve is concave anteriorly, reflecting the original shape of the developing embryo. At around four months of life, when infants begin to gain good control of their neck muscles, the secondary curves of the cervical spine begin to develop. The secondary curvature of the lumbar spine begins to develop around 18 months of life, once toddlers are on their feet and walking around. On occasion, the spine can exhibit abnormal curvatures. Kyphosis, also known as hunchback, is the exaggeration of the thoracic curvature, as shown here. Kyphosis is commonly associated with aging and osteoporosis of the spine. Note that in elderly postmenopausal females, they often experience depleted estrogen levels. A depletion of estrogen can lead to a loss of bone mass within their thoracic vertebral bodies. That loss of bone mass causes those vertebral bodies to become more wedge-shaped in appearance, and as such, that's what leads to the exaggerated curvature of the thoracic spine. And again, we'll call that kyphosis. Lordosis is an exaggeration of the lumbar curvature, as shown here. It is also known as swayback. Lordosis is commonly associated with either pregnancy or obesity. Anytime there is extra abdominal weight, it can put strain on the lumbar spine, pulling it into a lordotic state. Lastly, scoliosis, also known as crooked back, is a complicated deformity that is characterized by both a lateral curvature of the spine and vertebral rotation. The lateral curvature of the spine tends to cause a characteristic rib hump, as shown here. This rib hump tends to protrude on the side to which the spine has deviated. It is also very common for patients to present with uneven shoulders, as well as with hip elevation, as shown here. This posturing is a compensatory mechanism to help the individual maintain their center of balance.
Correcting severe scoliosis with curves at 45 degrees or more can be a real challenge for orthopedic surgeons, and it may require a series of surgeries. In 2015, there was a medical student here at Rush who spent a year living in Ethiopia before attending medical school. During that year's time, he worked at a clinic that treated children with severe spinal deformities. The majority of scoliosis patients he worked with had curves of over 80 degrees, with a handful setting world records with curves over 200 degrees. Here's one of the patients that he saw. The patient's name is Hoptum. Hoptum had a 120 degree lateral angle with a trunk rotation of 30 degrees. Here is the same patient from the anterior perspective, and notice the digital reconstruction of his spinal column. And here's Hoptum after surgery. It's amazing what orthopedic surgeons can do. Now let's look at the major components that form the typical structure of a vertebra. The sizable vertebral body forms the anterior portion of each vertebra. It gives strength to the vertebral column and supports the body's weight. The porous vertebral bodies have within them red bone marrow, and these bodies are very active sites for red blood cell formation. The vertebral arch is posterior to the vertebral body, and it consists of the pedicles, which are foot processes, and two laminae, which are thinner sheets of bone that adjoin to one another to form the posterior projecting spinous process. The posterior surface of the vertebral body, as well as the vertebral arch, form the walls of the vertebral foramen, which surrounds and protects the spinal cord. In a series of vertebrae, the vertebral foramina align to form a bony canal called the vertebral or spinal canal. The spinous process and the laterally projecting transverse processes serve as levers for muscles to act upon to produce the movements of the vertebral column or to anchor to in order to move the scapulae or head, for example. When viewed from the side, we can observe additional processes. The superior and inferior articular processes arise from the junctions of the pedicles and the laminae, and together, the union of the articular processes forms a joint called the zygopophyseal joint, also known as the fascia joint, and this joint is lined with hyaline cartilage. Functionally, the articular processes keep adjacent vertebrae aligned with one another and prevent the vertebra above from slipping anteriorly on the vertebra below. Together, the pedicles and the extensions of the articular processes creates both a superior and an inferior vertebral notch. When these notches align with one another, they create an opening, and this opening is referred to as the intervertebral foramen through which the spinal nerve passes. It's circled here in green. And this represents the spinal nerve exiting through the intervertebral foramen. While these typical components are seen in most vertebrae, there are some vertebrae that have very unique characteristics. Let's take a look at the cervical vertebrae next. In total, there are seven cervical vertebrae. The first two are so unique, they get their own slides. The characteristics demonstrated here only apply to C3 through C6. Notice the large triangular-shaped vertebral foramen. This foramen is large in this region because of the cervical enlargement of the spinal cord. The spinal cord is the largest in this area because of all the nerve fibers passing through it to head to the lower body and because of all the nerve fibers exiting from it destined for the upper limb. The spinous processes of cervical vertebrae are short and considered to be bifid, meaning they look like prongs. The exception would be the spinous process of C7. It's actually very long and is not bifid. The vertebral bodies of the cervical vertebrae are comparatively smaller than the other vertebral bodies, and they also have raised edges to them, which are called uncinate processes, shown here. The articulation of the uncinate process with the beveled vertebral body forms what are known as uncovertebral joints, as you see here. This is a type of synovial joint. These joints are clinically relevant because they happen to be sites where bone spurs form regularly, and bone spurs in patients in these areas can cause a lot of neck pain.
Another feature unique to cervical vertebrae are the oval-shaped transverse foramina. These are the openings in the center of the transverse processes. In front and behind each transverse foramen are two little knobs, the anterior and posterior tubercles. These tubercles simply act as sites for muscle attachments. Allow me to dwell just a moment longer on the anterior tubercle. Because the anterior tubercle of the cervical transverse process is a rib homologue, on rare occasions it can develop into a cervical rib. It is estimated that anywhere from 0.5 to 1% of the population has a cervical rib, as shown here. Because of its position, a cervical rib can impinge upon the nerves that exit from the neck in a condition called thoracic outlet syndrome. For now, appreciate that cervical ribs can develop and that they can arise from the anterior tubercles. We'll talk more about thoracic outlet syndrome later. The vertebral arteries, as shown here, and their accompanying veins are going to course through the transverse foramina. The exception, however, is the transverse foramina of C7. Notice that the vertebral arteries are coming out of the transverse foramina of C6, but do not pass through the transverse foramina of C7. Instead, only the vertebral veins will pass through C7. Again, these vertebral arteries are carrying blood supply to the brainstem and the brain. Cervical vertebrae 1 and 2 are unique in both shape and function. C1 is also known as the Atlas, named after the mythological Greek god who bore the weight of the celestial globe on his shoulders. The Atlas has neither a body nor a spinous process. In place of a body, the Atlas has two large lateral masses, which bear the weight of the skull. And on top of each of these lateral masses, the occipital condyles of the skull are going to articulate here with these superior articular surfaces. These are the facets upon which the occipital condyles will rock. Extending from the lateral masses toward the midline to form a complete ring of bone are both the anterior and the posterior arch, each with their own respective tubercles. Here's the posterior tubercle of the posterior arch, which essentially replaces the spinous process. And here we see the anterior tubercle associated with the anterior arch. The second cervical vertebra is known as the axis. And notice how it has two flat surfaces for articulation with the atlas from above. The most distinguishing feature of the axis is the dens, also known as the odontoid process. In the upper right of the screen, in this image, you can see how the atlas above is seated on the axis below. Notice how the dens articulates with the posterior aspect of the anterior arch of C1. There's even a small facet for the dens as shown here. Notice how the dens is held in place against the atlas via this ligament called the transverse ligament of the atlas. Not only that, but the dens is held in place by both cruciate and alar ligaments as well. The word ala refers to wing. So these wing-like projections are the alar ligaments holding the dens in contact with the base of the skull. Perhaps you've heard of something called an internal decapitation. What happens is the alar ligaments in particular, along with the cruciate ligaments, rupture. And rupture of those ligaments means that the skull can no longer be securely fastened to the cervical vertebrae. As such, the skull about the size of a bowling ball and about the weight of a bowling ball can become very loose and can fall forward or backwards. And when that happens, there can be a transection of the spinal cord as a result. That's known as internal decapitation. Because of the configuration between the atlas and the axis, the atlantoaxial joint permits rotation of the head. So when you shake your head no, the atlas is pivoting around the dens of the axis, allowing you to shake your head no. When you shake your head yes, the occipital condyles at the base of the skull are rocking back and forth on the superior facets of the atlas at the atlanto-occipital joint. And so that motion allows you to shake your head yes.
If there is ever a need to view the DENS radiographically, the best approach to take is to view it through an x-ray taken through the mouth. So notice here the lower jaw with the teeth, and here you can see the outline of the DENS. Visualizing the DENS from this angle could allow you to see if it's fractured or not. The thoracic vertebrae are characterized by a round vertebral foramen and a heart-shaped vertebral body. Because the thoracic vertebrae provide attachments for the ribs, they also feature costal facets that are positioned on the sides of the vertebral bodies as well as on the transverse process. With the exception of rib 1, the head of a single rib is going to make contact with two thoracic vertebrae. And don't forget that ribs are numbered according to the vertebra where the costal tubercle of the rib adjoins with the transverse costal facet, as shown here. So let's take a look at this example. Here we have the vertebral body of T6, and this would represent the costal facet of that same vertebra, T6. Therefore, the rib attaching to that costal facet must be rib 6. But notice how the head of the rib is attaching to the inferior facet of T5 and the superior facet of T6. Because of the weight the lumbar vertebrae must bear, they have very massive, thick vertebral bodies, and they happen to have hatchet-shaped spinous processes. Notice that the superior articular processes happen to be angled more medially than those of the upper vertebrae. The functional consequence of this orientation is that no rotation is permitted in the lumbar vertebrae. Flexion, extension, and lateral flexion are permitted in the lumbar spine, but because of the interlocking of the articular processes, no rotation of the lumbar spine is permitted. You might notice I have a silhouette of a Scotty dog shown here on the screen, and this is to point out a very specific area of the lumbar vertebra known as the pars interarticularis. If you look at a single lumbar vertebra from an oblique angle, it kind of looks like the outline of a Scotty dog, and the neck of the Scotty dog represents the pars interarticularis. When literally translated, pars interarticularis means the area between the two articular processes. So here's the superior articular process above, and here's the inferior articular process below. The pars interarticularis happens to have clinical significance. It is a site where a fracture can occur that can lead to spine slippage in a condition called spondylolisthesis. So in other words, the lumbar vertebral body uh, that sits above this particular vertebra here could actually slide forward because there is no superior articular process to hold it back in place, especially if there's a fracture here of the pars interarticularis. Again, that condition is known colloquially as spine slippage, and it's known clinically as spondylolisthesis. Five fused sacral vertebrae constitute the triangular-shaped sacrum, which articulates with L5 above at the lumbosacral joint, where the last intervertebral disc is positioned. So I'll draw in a really thick intervertebral disc here. The anterior projecting edge of S1 of the sacrum is known as the promontory, and the wing-like projections coming off of the sacral bodies are known as the alae. Again, the word ala means wing. These alae are going to articulate with the pelvic bones at the sacroiliac joint, and they're going to transmit the weight of the body to the pelvic girdle. The sacral canal is the continuation of the vertebral canal within the context of the sacrum, and it's going to contain the sacral nerve roots. So here's the sacral canal. And these sacral nerve roots are going to exit the sacral canal through both anterior and posterior sacral foramina. And the sacral canal will end at the sacral hiatus which is covered in life by a ligament called the sacral coccygeal ligament, which connects the sacrum to the coccyx below. The remnants of the sacral spinous processes are collectively referred to as the median sacral crest. And here you also see the lateral sacral crest, which is a remnant of the transverse processes.
the three to four fused coccygeal vertebrae constitute the coccyx, which is the tailbone. The coccyx is going to articulate with the apex of the sacrum. The cornua, or the horns of the coccyx, will articulate with the sacral cornua. Here are the sacral cornua, and here are the cornua of the coccyx. These cornua are analogous to the articular processes of a typical vertebra. Along both the axial and the appendicular skeleton, there are several bony prominences that serve as useful landmarks for identifying and referencing nearby structures. The external occipital protuberance is a midline bony projection at the base of the skull. If you run your hand along the back of your head at the base of the skull, you'll feel a bump. That's the external occipital protuberance. And in a moment, we'll discuss some of the structures that attach there. The vertebra prominens, as shown here, is the spinous process of C7. Again, if you take your hand and run it along your neck toward the base of your neck, you'll feel a prominent bump. That bump is the vertebra prominens, the spinous process of C7. If you flex your head by bringing your chin all the way down to your chest, you can palpate in the midline on the back of your neck a tough band of connective tissue. This tough band of connective tissue is called the ligamentum nuque, and it's going to be an attachment point for some muscles we'll cover in just a moment. Here's the ligamentum nuque shown in this bottom right image. Now let's take a look at the scapula. In regards to the scapula, many of its edges and projections can actually be palpated. The spine of the scapula is an obliquely oriented ridge of bone that starts near the vertebral or medial border, which is shown here, and it heads upward toward the shoulder, and it ends as the acromion. Here we see the superior angle of the scapula. This will be an important point of reference for dissection because one of the muscles that you'll be searching for is going to attach here, called the uh, levator scapulae muscle. In addition to a medial border, the scapula also has a lateral border, which is sometimes referred to as the axillary border because it's on the side of the armpit. Recall that the term axilla means armpit. Now that you're familiar with some of the bony uh, landmarks, we can now take a look at the muscles and where they're attaching. In this section, we'll cover the superficial muscles of the back along with their neurovasculature. Here are the skin incisions that will be made in order to visualize the superficial back muscles. First start at the external occipital protuberance and make a midline incision down the back until you reach the sacrum. The second cut should be made from the external occipital protuberance over toward the lateral neck just below the ear. And you'll follow along the lateral neck onto the shoulder. Then at about the midpoint of the back, you'll make a cut from the mid-axillary line over to the midline incision. And then you will also make a fourth cut that follows the contours of the iliac crest from the mid-axillary line all the way down to the sacrum. These cuts are going to allow you to reflect the skin laterally. And by doing so, you'll then visualize the superficial back muscles, the most superficial of which will be the trapezius muscle. As you're making cuts through the skin, take just a moment to appreciate the layers of the body's largest organ. Functionally, the skin is a protective barrier. It regulates heat, it synthesizes and stores vitamin D, and of course, it has specialized receptors for touch. The skin itself has two layers, the epidermis and the dermis. The epidermis is the outermost protective layer, and it has no blood vessels or lymphatics within it. The dermis is a dense layer of connective tissue made of collagen and elastic fibers that lies just deep to the epidermis. And unlike the epidermis, the dermis is vascularized. Just beneath the dermis is a layer of loose subcutaneous tissue referred to as the superficial fascia. The superficial fascia is composed mostly of fat, which is important for thermal regulation. And within the superficial fascia also lives sweat glands and blood vessels and nerves. Enveloping the muscles themselves is a layer of dense connective tissue called the deep or investing fascia, as shown here. When you're dissecting, you'll want to ideally expose the plane between the superficial and the deep fascia, 
This plane right here is the plane you'll want to expose so that you can remove the skin above and the superficial fascia from the underlying muscle below. As soon as the skin and superficial fascia are reflected, two of the four superficial back muscles will be exposed immediately. Those two muscles are the trapezius muscle, shown here, and the latissimus dorsi muscle. The remaining two muscles of the superficial back group are the rhomboids, shown here, and the levator scapulae muscle. Although this group of four muscles is referred to as the superficial back muscles, these muscles don't actually act on the back. Instead, these muscles act on the shoulder girdle, principally the scapula, to move the structures associated with the upper limb. So now let's take a detailed look at each muscle individually. The trapezius is a very broad, diamond-shaped muscle with four points of attachment. It attaches to the superior nuchal lines that extend laterally from the external occipital protuberance, shown here. Along the length of the upper vertebral column, the trapezius muscle attaches indirectly to the cervical spinous processes through that band of connective tissue called the ligamentum nuchae and then it will attach directly to the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebrae, as shown here. The trapezius also attaches to the lateral one-third of the clavicle anteriorly, as well as to the spine and the acromion of the scapula, as you see here. Functionally speaking, the trapezius acts on the scapula and the lateral clavicle. What's interesting about the trapezius is that this muscle has fibers that are oriented in three different directions. First and foremost, understand that muscles are functionally designed to contract, meaning their fibers shorten. So whenever we look at the upper fibers associated with the trapezius muscle, we see these fibers extending from the superior nuchal lines on downward toward the acromion and spine of the scapula. Since the vertebral column isn't going anywhere because that is the anchor point for the trapezius, that means the scapula is going to move. And in this case, when those upper fibers contract or shorten, the scapula is going to be elevated. Here are the transverse fibers of the scapula running horizontally. When these fibers shorten, the scapula will be drawn closer to the midline. In other words, it will allow for the action of scapular retraction. And lastly, when the lower fibers contract, they're both going to depress the scapula, and in addition, it's going to help the scapula to perform upward rotation. When the scapula moves and rotates upward, like, upwardly like this, that is upward rotation. Here's a better view of the ligamentum nuchae uh, with the muscles removed from the image. So this ligament is an extension of a ligament called the supraspinous ligament, which we'll revisit next time. For the time being, just appreciate the ligamentum nuchae runs from the external occipital protuberance all the way down to the spinous process of C7. So all this area here represents the ligamentum nuchae. Notice the distance between the tips of the cervical spinous processes and where the trapezius muscle would actually be attaching to the ligamentum nuchae. That's why we consider the trapezius to attach indirectly to the cervical spinous processes. The nerve responsible for innervating the trapezius muscle is cranial nerve number 11, known as the spinal accessory nerve. This nerve is purely motor. You'll find this nerve running just deep to the trapezius muscle, and it's going to emerge near the base of the neck. You'll also be on the lookout for the superficial transverse cervical artery. This artery is going to supply blood to the trapezius muscle. To visualize the artery and the nerve, you'll want to make a cut along the trapezius in the midline, and you'll want to reflect the trapezius both laterally and superiorly in this direction. In order to reflect it in this direction, notice that you'll also have to shave the trapezius muscle away from its attachment onto the spine of the scapula and the acromion. After the reflection is done, it should be pretty easy to find both the spinal accessory nerve, the superficial transverse cervical artery, and its accompanying superficial transverse cervical vein. The latissimus dorsi, which when literally translated means broad back, is a very broad muscle that spans from the mid to lower back.
In the midline, the latissimus dorsi attaches through the thoracolumbar fascia. It uses this fascia to attach to the spinous processes of the lower thoracic as well as the lumbar vertebrae. At the lower boundary of the muscle, it's going to also attach to the iliac crest as well as the sacrum. The latissimus dorsi is going to insert onto the humerus. When the arm is flexed, the latissimus dorsi helps to extend the arm, and if the arm is abducted away from the body, the latissimus dorsi is going to help to adduct the arms back closer to the body. In weight training, bodybuilders like to use what's known as the lat bar to strengthen the, the latissimus dorsi muscle. The lat bar is a bar that you place behind your neck, and you will grab onto that bar and lower it toward your shoulders. And in doing so, you are taking your arms from an abducted position and bringing them down to an adducted position. And you're doing that against the resistance of the weights, thereby bulking up the latissimus dorsi muscle. And because the latissimus dorsi wraps around to the anterior side of the humerus, that means it's also going to be responsible for participating in medial rotation of the arm. Here's an anterior view of the latissimus dorsi muscle, and from this view, you can see the tendon of the muscle inserting into the floor of the intertubercular sulcus. That sulcus is also known as the bicipital groove. Because of this orientation, whenever the latissimus dorsi muscle contracts, it can assist in medially rotating the humerus. From this same view, you can also appreciate the nerve and artery of the same name that supply this muscle. Here's the nerve coming from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus called the thoracodorsal nerve. There's also a thoracodorsal artery, which happens to come from the subscapular artery, which arises from the axillary artery. We're going to revisit this nerve artery pair in our next few lectures. So for now, just appreciate that the thoracodorsal nerve and artery are responsible for supplying the latissimus dorsi muscle. By reflecting the trapezius muscle, you'll be able to visualize the levator scapulae and the rhomboid muscles. As its name implies, the levator scapulae is responsible for elevating the scapula. The muscle will attach from the transverse processes of the upper four cervical vertebrae, and it will insert onto the superior angle of the scapula as shown here. In addition to assisting with elevation, the levator scapulae is also going to help fix the scapula, especially when there is downward force or traction placed against the humerus, like when carrying a heavy load, for example. When you perform the action of shrugging your shoulders, not only are you activating the levator scapulae muscle, but don't forget you're also activating those upper fibers of the trapezius muscle as well. The rhomboids are made up of the rhomboid major and rhomboid minor, and there's not always a clear line of demarcation that separates the two. However, the root of the spine of the scapula can be used as a useful landmark for trying to demarcate between the rhomboid minor above and the larger rhomboid major below. As their name suggests, they are in fact rhomboid in appearance. These muscles are going to attach from the spinous processes of C7 all the way down to T5, and they will make their insertion onto the medial, aka vertebral border of the scapula. As such, functionally, the rhomboids are going to draw the scapula closer to the midline. This is referred to as scapular retraction. You can demonstrate the action of scapular retraction by placing your hands on your hips and moving your elbows closer to one another posteriorly. You would have a patient perform this same action against resistance if you wanted to test the integrity of these rhomboid muscles. The nerve and blood supply to the rhomboids, as well as to the levator scapulae muscles, is through the dorsal scapular nerve and dorsal scapular artery. During dissection, you'll want to reflect the rhomboids laterally from their vertebral attachments in order to look at their undersurface. And near the medial border of the undersurface of the rhomboids is where you'll begin to locate the dorsal scapular nerve and the small dorsal scapular artery.
Sometimes the dorsal scapular artery is referred to as the deep branch of the transverse cervical artery. You'll notice I've crossed that term out. For our purposes, we'll just call it the dorsal scapular artery. Technically, the difference uh, arises when you start to discuss the origin of the vessel. If the vessel comes from the subclavian artery, then technically it's called the dorsal scapular artery. However, if it originates from the transverse cervical artery, then technically it's the deep branch. For our purposes, we'll just call it the dorsal scapular artery. That concludes this video on the vertebral osteology and the superficial back. Until next time, take care.